Hello students, this is a proton and carbon NMR uh, spectroscopy video. Uh, get comfortable because it's going to be kind of long. It'll be very informative, so I would highly suggest that you get your notes out and take some notes, write some stuff down, because there are some really big important pieces of information that will help us uh, both solve structures and understand spectroscopy when we do this. So. Uh, let's get started. So nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This is very different than synthesis and chemical reactions and other organic chemistry that we've done throughout the semester. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk a minute about what NMR is. NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance and I think it's the most powerful tool in organic chemistry for solving a structure or for doing spectroscopic studies. Um, there are a lot of different nuclei that you can study with uh, NMR. You can study proton NMR, which is the most common. You can study carbon-13. And then there are some of the oddballs, like carbon, um, nitrogen-15, fluorine-19, phosphorus-31. These are the two that we're going to focus on in this lecture. Specifically, the majority of it will be about hydrogen. And that's probably the most common in chemistry as well. Okay, so hopefully you remember back to Gen Chem when you had those four quantum numbers. Remember there was like M, L, M sub L, or N L, M sub L, and S. S stood for the spin quantum number, right? So hopefully we recall that a nuclei <coughs> that has an odd atomic number has a spin value, right? So that spin could be uh, what we refer to as the nuclear spin. And the way we kind of conceptualize it in organic chemistry, or the way I teach it anyway, is that think of the nucleus, which, you know, is just a bunch of protons and, and uh, neutrons together. Think of them as little bar magnets, where they're north on one side and south on the other. Oh, come on, Penn, what are you doing? Alright, so, uh, hold one second, my stupid pen is not working. Okay, back, sorry about that, had to do a recalibration of the pen real quick. So we can think about the nuclei as little bar magnets, um, where they go, uh, they have a north end and a south end. And so if we take those nuclei and we put them into a magnetic field inside a giant magnet, when the nuclei are originally just kind of pointing in any random direction, when we apply a magnetic field that has a particular magnetic field strength, which is referred to as B naught here, some Gauss value, uh, the magnet, by the nature of what magnets do, magnets are crazy, right? Uh, either the north end will be attracted to the south end, which is what we're accustomed to, but depending upon how the magnetic field lines run, in which way the original nuclei was pointing, Sometimes the nuclei will align themselves parallel to the magnetic field, but pointing in the opposite direction, so the north will be closer to the north. Obviously, this is not a favorable interaction, and so this is a higher energy state. Right? The, the more favorable interaction, where the north is by the south, and the south is by the north, that's a lower energy state, right? so that's more stable. So most of the nuclei would prefer to be in this state, and they don't want to be in this state, but depending upon the random orientation that they started with over here, they may not have that choice. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to give these states some labels. The lower state we're just going to call the alpha state, and the higher energy state we're going to call the beta state. And what we're going to do in spectroscopy as chemists is we're going to force the alphas to turn into the betas by adding energy. Right? So there's a difference in energy between the alpha state and the beta state, Oops, alpha state and the beta state, and we're going to increase the alpha energy to beta by irradiating the molecule with uh, electromagnetic radiation, and that's the spectroscopy part, the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with matter. That's the spectroscopy part of proton NMR spectroscopy. Okay, So we start out with a sample, maybe in like a, a beaker or whatever, maybe in the liquid state, could be gas, and the, the spins of the nuclei are just pointing in all these random directions. We then put that whole thing in a magnet, which has magnetic field lines, wow, wow, wow. and then all of a sudden all the states are forced to exist in one of these two states, the alpha or the beta, depending upon the direction of the magnetic field lines and the original orientation of the spin of that particular nucleus. So basically we're, we're forcing this dichotomy between the two states. And then we irradiate with a certain amount of energy to convert the alpha state to the beta state. Now it turns out the amount of energy we need to add is actually really low. Right? It sounds like it's a really high, crazy thing, but it's actually radio waves. So radio waves, which have a long <coughs> wavelength, right? the distance between this and this, that's a long wavelength, that's a low energy. So kind of 
energetically speaking, compared to the IR and the UV vis and things like that we've been, that we've been doing, uh, the amount of energy we're using here to irradiate and convert the alphas into the betas is actually really low. It's like I said, it's on the order of radio waves, so they're really long. Okay. Now, of course, you can do a bunch of calculations. Oh, wow, that didn't render properly at all. That's fine. You could do a bunch of calculations that um, would say, how much energy do I need to add? Well, what is the magnetic field strength in Gauss? Uh, what is the gyromagnetic ratio? There should be a term here called gamma. That's what this is, gamma. Um, I use um, I use some, uh, shall we say, software that I got from the library that uh, doesn't always render things properly. So uh, the gyromagnetic ratio is, a, is dependent upon which nucleus that you're talking about, right? The gyromagnetic ratio says, what is the difference in energy between alpha and beta? Is it this? Or is beta all the way up here and alpha all the way down there? Each nuclei is going to be unique. So that's a specific value um, in per second per Gauss for each hertz, or for each um, nuclei that we're talking about. Then we have the magnetic field strength that we're talking about. That's our B naught value. And you could do a bunch of math. I don't care about that, and neither does um, the ACS exam. So I'm just kind of blow over this because we're not trying to become infrared spectros um, IRs. Try that again. We're not trying to become proton and MR spectroscopists here and professionals. We just want to know how does it work, how do we use it, how is it useful for us. Okay. Um, there is a little bit of uh, a problem with this, though, right? And I'll get into this in a second. And that's the idea of magnetic shielding. Since what we're doing is we're taking a sample, right? I'm just going to use a test tube with some liquid in it, and it has a bunch of nuclei in it, and those nuclei are randomly arrayed, and we're putting that thing inside a magnet, and we're turning the magnetic on, magnet on, so the magnetic field lines, right, interfere with the sample. Now, if all the hydrogens in the sample are the exact same as each other, then every single hydrogen has the same exact thing happening to it. Every hydrogen goes from being an H alpha or an H beta. After turning on the magnet, they all turn into H betas, right? Um, that's if all hydrogens are the same. And that implies that the distance in energy, or the difference, I should say, the difference in energy between these two states is exactly singly valued. However, if I have a molecule where the hydrogens are not the same as each other, like methanol, right, where this hydrogen is bonded to an oxygen, but these hydrogens are bonded to a carbon, that changes the, diff changes the energy between the alpha state and the beta state. And so per our calculation up here, it changes uh, what wavelength we need to add an energy to jump the alphas to the betas. And so that has a direct impact on what's going to happen with chemistry. And without giving you too much more information, we call that magnetic shielding and that's what we're going to look at in a little bit. Okay, here's a slightly better picture of it. If the hydrogen nuclei, right, was naked, and it was just by itself, it had no electrons, it was just a proton, right? If I had a bag of protons, which doesn't make any sense, but assume I did, right? It only takes some amount of energy, this, whatever that is, some amount of energy, to flip it from the lower energy alpha state up to the higher energy beta state. That's a single value thing. But in real molecules, we don't have a bag of protons, right? The, the nuclei are shielded or are bonded to the molecule. So coming back to my methanol example, I have a molecular orbital, right, that looks like this, which is composed of an sp3 hybrid orbital from the carbon and a an, uh, 1s hydrogen orbital that make the sigma orbital. Right? I have an orbital that exists kind of around both of these nuclei. And so there are electrons floating around in space around this hydrogen. Well, electrons have a negative charge. So if I take a magnet, you guys like my drawing of a magnet? It's pretty sweet, huh? Right, if I take a magnet and I put it by this molecule, the electrons that exist in the orbital, in that sigma orbital, are going to interfere with the magnetic field lines, right, right there. So they will say, magnet, you're applying some particular strength, we'll call that B naught as a Gauss value, but the hydrogen nucleus, the part that's in the core, only experiences less energy than that, B naught minus X, where X is the amount of shielding provided by the electrons of interest, right? So if I was talking about iodine, for example, right? Iodine has how many electrons? 1s, 1s1, 1s2, 2s2, 2b, 
6, 3S2, 3P6, 3D, 4D, blah, 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 all those guys, right? It has layers and layers and layers of electrons. If I try to irradiate the iodine and do NMR on the iodine, yeah, sure, I could do it, I guess, if it, it has an odd value. Um, but I have to fight my way through all of these electrons. And every time I pass through an electron or an electric field as generated by an electron, the amount of energy that gets through is decreased by some value, right? We call that a shielding effect, right? Because the electrons are literally acting as a shield from this induced magnetic field, this B naught value. And so the actual val value that's measured or observed by the hydrogen nucleus in our methanol case is less than the output of the magnet to begin with, right? So what do we have to do to compensate for that? We have to increase B naught specifically by x so that the value that is actually observed by the hydrogen nucleus is indeed b naught the value that we need it to be to actually do the alpha to beta flip hopefully that makes sense to you it's a lot of stuff but it, maybe it makes a little more sense when we see some real examples instead of just little cartoony things okay so coming back to my 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 methanol example right we know that hydrogen carbon bonds are nonpolar. There is not a significant difference in electronegativity between the carbon and the hydrogen. So we have a sigma orbital here, and we have a sigma orbital here, and we have a sigma orbital here. And for the most part, these orbitals are symmetrical 50 50, nice little ovals. But if I draw the oxygen hydrogen bond not as a stick, but I draw it more as um, kind of, uh, as I draw ink, it represents more electron density, right? The molecule looks more like this, right? Where the hydrogen is a delta positive and the oxygen is a partial negative, right? Or Kronecker negative, right? That means that when I take this magnetic field, so you get to draw a magnet again, pew, pew, all right? And I let the magnetic, the magnet, interact with this hydrogen. This hydrogen here, let me erase my line so you can see it. This hydrogen here will be more strongly affected by the magnetic field because it has less of a shield as compared to these guys over here, which have a stronger shield, i.e. they have more electron density surrounding them. Hopefully that makes sense. That's a very key concept. This idea is called de-shielding, whereby <coughs> as, an electron, as a hydrogen is on a molecule that has electronegative elements, you know, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, you know the electronegative elements, um, as it's on the molecule, the effect of the electronegativity of that element pulls electron density away from the hydrogen and thereby exposes it to the magnetic field more so. And so that effect shows up in the corresponding spectrum that we're going to interpret. Okay, and here's some text that you can read about that if you want. But I like my explanation better, of course. Okay, so let's get to the actual spectrum now. Uh, we covered, if you're in my lab, we covered this already a little bit, but this is very important. This is definitely something you need to write down and make sure you understand. When we're interpreting the proton NMR spectrum, or, yeah, the proton NMR spectrum, there are four key pieces of information, four key pieces, you, that you, we are going to use to interpret the spectrum. These are really, really important. Okay, so I'm going to highlight them because they're so important. I'm going to change my highlighter color and everything. Let's see. The number of signals, right, and I'm using, um, I'm using the word signals here intentionally, and I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. The number of signals tells you about the number of types. They say kinds here, but I like to say types. Types of protons, right? That's, uh, that's a big deal. It doesn't tell you how many protons. It just tells you how many types of protons. We'll get into that in a second. The location of the signals, and when we say location, we're talking about the x-axis value, right? Where on the x-axis are the signals located, right? That tells you about the shieldedness, right? Are the molecules de-shielded or shielded, right? What type of generic environment are they in? That gives us hints about functional groups, actually. The third one is called the intensity of the signal, also referred to as the integration, which basically says the size of the signal is a function of how many protons there are, okay? Whereas in IR spectroscopy, if we had uh, our methanol, for example, let me jump back. If we had methanol, CH3OH, 
right? And I draw the spectrum for methanol. We get a big old swoopy thing for the OH, and then we get a bunch of jig jags for our sp3 CH. And these were about the same height. However, there's only one OH bond, and there's three CH bonds, right? The height of the peak in the infrared spectrum is uh, not related to how many of those particular bonds exist. Right? Whereas in proton NMR, that is not the case. The number of protons does indeed tell you about, um, does indeed relate directly to the intensity of that signal, or what we say is the integration, the area under the curve of that signal. And the last one is the most powerful technique, or the most powerful part about proton NMR spectroscopy. And that's what we call the splitting of the signal, also referred to as the multiplicity of the signal. And that tells you about the neighborhood in which the hydrogens exist, right? So I'm just going to put here, and you should too in your notes, the neighborhood. So not only do we know some information about the hydrogens in and of themselves, we also now know some information about the hydrogens that are next to the hydrogens that we were talking about. And so by talking about specific hydrogens, we could say, okay, I know X, Y, and Z. And by looking at the multiplicity, we could say, oh, I also know about the neighbors of those hydrogens. And between, when we do that for every hydrogen, it turns out there's only one way that the structure can exist. Okay, so these are the four key pieces of information that we want to extract from every single proton NMR spectrum that we interpret. Okay, let's take a quick look at how the spectrometer works and what it looks like in real life, then let's get to some spectra. So I take my sample tube, it's this real skinny test tube, basically, I put my sample in there, it could be the liquid or gas state, it could even be a solid state, actually, I believe. We put it inside a giant, really strong magnet, which is usually super liquid cooled with liquid hydrogen and liquid, or, um, liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. We have an RF transmitter, this is the thing that makes the pulse, which converts the uh, alpha states into the beta state, so this is the provider of that radio frequency information. We pulse the alphas into betas, and then we sit and wait. As the betas naturally decay back down to the alphas, the detector will pick up a fluctuation in the magnetic field, because the betas are dropping down to alphas, and so the magnetic field is getting disturbed, and the detector says, wait, something happened, and draw a peak as a function of magnetic field strength. Okay, So, uh, let's look at an actual instrument. This guy over here, that's the NMR spectrometer. Uh, it's a big golden or uh, silver tube because it's filled with liquid helium and liquid nitrogen to keep it cold because these magnets are very strong magnets. Um, so strong, in fact, that most of them often have lines, like those those like police tape lines on the ground that if you have like credit cards and stuff and you walk inside it it'll you know bleach your credit cards and kill it so you gotta um, you gotta have no nothing in your pockets usually they have something like this one. this one either might not be working or it's like a specialty lab I don't know where this lab is if you guys are on over on ASU campus um, there's an NMR facility that has NMRs you know about two stories high you know thousand megahertz Gauss magnets like they're pretty 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 awesome instruments but of course they're really expensive you know like million dollars and stuff so yeah so anyway and they're all operated from this CRT uh, computer all right let's take a look at the graph eh, I don't like that we're not calling it a graph this is the NMR spectrum because we are doing spectroscopy that's stupid okay so uh, let's take a look at some of the things um, where do we start let's start with a number of types of hydrogen right in my example, methanol, I have the type of hydrogen that is bonded to the oxygen, and I have the type of hydrogen that is bonded as part of the methyl group. Right? The way that I do this, and the way that I figure out similarity, and it sounds silly, but you should try this. Seriously, try it by yourself. S pretend you're this guy, and say who you are in detail, and see if you repeat yourself. So if I was this hydrogen, I would say, I'm a hydrogen that's bonded to a carbon of methanol. If I was, let me get rid of my marks, if I was this guy, I would say, I'm a hydrogen that's bonded to a carbon that's part of methanol. That's the exact same thing. I'm a hydrogen that's bonded to a carbon that's part of methanol, right? That's all the same words. And so these are all the same as each other. If I was this guy, however, and I'll put it in a little box, I would say, I'm a hydrogen that's bonded to an oxygen that's part of methanol. That's very different, right? Oxygen is not carbon. And so this guy is one signal, and these three collectively will be another signal. And so the size of the signal, right, each one of these things is called a signal, not a peak. The size of the signal is directly related to how many protons make that signal exist. So if this is size 1, 
this has to be size 3 because there are three of them that make it happen. Let's look at its x-axis location. Right? The signal for the OH peak, for the H, excuse me, the signal for the H in the OH part of the molecule is more downfield. Right? That's the term we use, downfield, which means it is more de-shielded. De-shielded, let's see, de-shielded. Right? Those guys go together. And upfield means more shielded. So essentially we can think of it as more polar parts of the molecule or hydrogens that are on more polar parts of the molecule and hydrogens that are on more nonpolar parts of the molecule, right? So the methyl groups, the hydrogens that are part of a methyl group, they're the same as each other, so they integrate for three, meaning the, the peaks, the signal size will be three. And they, they're directly bonded to a carbon and that carbon is next to an oxygen, so instead of being down here, maybe they're slightly more downfield than you'd expect. And we'll get some actual numbers and values on this to make it meaningful in a second. Okay, if you notice in our spectrum here, we have this guy. I'm sure a lot of you were like, what is that, Jay? Please tell us. Well, don't worry, here's what it is. Um, because, 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 because HNMR spectroscopy has been around for a while, lots of people have been doing these experiments with lots of different types of instruments with varying degrees of resolution and quality. And so we, as chemists, need a way to say, okay, I did this experiment in 1980 on a, you know, a computer that was using a card reader. Uh, how do I compare my results to a computer from 2015 you know, that cost a million dollars? Well, the way we do that is we apply a standard. A standard, especially an internal standard, is something we intentionally add to our molecule. In this case, the thing that we add is tetramethylsilane, which is just referred to as TMS. And tetramethylsilane has a nice strong signal that integrates for 12, 3 times 4, right? Um, and all three, all 12 of those hydrogens are exactly the same as each other, and so they always show up at the same spot. And so no matter what instrument I run this on, if I define this signal as zero, then I can actually look at my sample and say, okay, what is the distance from here to here? That's some value. What is the distance from here oops, that's all wonky, from here to here, that is some value, right? Now I can compare this to someone from another experiment because I'm making the same comparison. It's a difference from an internal standard that everyone uses. So this is our TMS internal standard, right? And so when you run NMRs, you'll run it with TMS. Uh, if you look at NMR spectrum, sometimes this shows up. Sometimes people leave it out because it's assumed to be there, so. Right, the way that we measure these values, rather than just generic, you know, x's and y's, obviously, is through an actual calculation. Now, I don't, this is not a math class, so I don't care about calculations, but I do want to show you where it comes from. Right, the way that we calculate the x-axis value of the proton NMR spectrum is in what we call parts per million, ppm, or the delta scale. Uh, I like delta personally because PPM is misleading. PPM stands for parts per million. It's a, it's a measurement of concentration, which is a stupid terminology. They should not use it in this, but they do, so we're stuck. Um, it should just say delta, right? The way you calculate delta is how far did your signal move from TMS, which is what I was just talking about. Right, so if here's my signal, there's TMS, and I have a signal there. How far is this right, in hertz? And I have to divide that by my spectrometer frequency because there are different spectrometers that you can use. Some are more expensive and better, more powerful than others. And you have to take that into account. The stronger your magnet is, the, the more resolution you can get on your spectrum, right? So a 60 megahertz instrument would say, I see X, so my delta would be X over 60. Whereas in a 300 megahertz instrument, my delta would be x over 300, right? And so I can, now I can compare delta for my exam, my experiment to delta for some cheapo experiment, maybe from the 80s or whatever, right? So it allows us to um, compare apples to apples when we do experiments as a function of time or as a function of instrument quality or even of uh, technical ability, like the ability of the computer to actually calculate and measure these things. Okay, so you, there's a solved problem. You can actually do some math going on. I don't care about that. Um, there's a, just some common chemical shifts for things, right? As I start to put more and more electronegative elements on the molecule, the hydrogen gets more and more 
deshielded. So what happens to the value of the chemical shift? It goes from something of being very low, essentially zero because it's the same as tetramethylsilane, to more and more and more deshielded, meaning and this is confusingly written backwards because you know that's how we do things, right? Meaning to the left, downfield deshielded, larger delta values. Okay, so here's a, a reference sheet that is useful. You'll definitely want to reference this. Unfortunately, you don't get it on the final, um, but for the most part, the interpretation of proton and MR spectrums on the ACS final is relatively simple, right? It's mostly the red flag type stuff. So um, uh, you can pause it and record this if you want. It's obviously it's in your textbook as Table 13.3. Um, I'm going to blow over it so you can get to some of the more important information. Okay, a couple other things we need to watch out for. Because we're talking about induced current in a magnetic field, if we have an aromatic ring, right? Normally we would say a carbon-carbon double bond that has a hydrogen on it. This, even though you may not know this, but sp2 carbons are more electronegative than sp3 carbons. So the bond dipole in an sp2 carbon is slightly stronger than in an sp3 carbon. It's okay if you know that, doesn't matter, right? This bond dipole is actually a little bit larger than this bond dipole here. And so if we actually look at the reference values, for example, uh, a hydrogen that's part of like a methyl or a methylene shows up in the about 1, 1 1.5, somewhere in there. But if we talk about the hydrogen that's on a vinyl group, like part of a double bond, look where that shows up. That's a huge difference, right? 5 to 6 is much larger than about 1 to 1 1.5. And so that's because of the presence of this double bond and the carbon is more electronegative. And double bonds do this ring current thing. All right, so if I had a, an aromatic ring, right, a benzene ring, and I'm talking about the hydrogens that are bonded to the ring, well, as soon as I put in a magnetic field on electrons, especially electrons that are in a pi system, they start to circulate, and they start to go around in a circle. Um, if you took physics, you know about the right-hand rule and all the you know, electro electromagnetic field lines and things like that. I don't care about that stuff. The, the take-home message here is that uh, pi systems, whether it's a carbon-oxygen double bond, a carbon-nitrogen double bond, a carbon-carbon double bond, or like a benzene ring or similar, or a series of pi, pi systems, you know, something like this. Those guys will um, induce current, which we call, if it was a ring, we call it a ring current, which then will, in, um, will reinforce the magnetic field of B0. So it artificially increases B0, and so what the effect is is that H gets deshielded more than you would normally expect. So for example, sorry, I'll clean up some of my marks here. So if you would expect the vinyl hydrogen, that's this guy, to show up at 5 to 6, you would think, well, these are similar because they're on a carbon-carbon double bond. They should also be 5 to 6. But if we go back to our reference sheet and we find it, <coughs> the hydrogen that's on an aromatic ring actually shows up in the 6 to 9 region, typically around 7 or 8 depending upon if there's decorations on the ring, right? And that's because of this ring current. So that's, that's a very useful, important piece of information. The same is true for alkenes. This is what I just mentioned, right? You get the, the reinforcement of the external magnetic field, and so these get more deshielded than you would normally expect. And the same is true for alkynes, right? You get this ring, the pi system uh, generates uh, an induced current, which, um, which in this case, because of where the hydrogen exists, it exists here rather than over here, right, perpendicular to the system. The, in, the magnetic field called B, the magnetic field that's induced, is actually a shielding event. So even though it's the case that this is more electronegative in terms of identity than that, because of the way the current works and because of the way the field lines work and where the hydrogen sits relative to those field lines, this is a shielding event. And so if we jump up and check the hydrogen that's part of an acetylene group, it actually shows up more shielded than the corresponding vinyl one. And that you would not expect on the face of it. You really have to look at the details of the, where the magnetic field lines are to figure that out. But that's where these numbers come from. And that's an important piece of information when you're trying to determine the structure of a molecule. If something shows up where it doesn't show up, you say, oh, maybe I have a triple bond that I was unaware of or something like that. Okay, the uh, carbon-oxygen can do the same thing. If we were talking specifically about an aldehyde group, Right? The pi system does this deshielding event, but now you have two things that are reinforcing each other. You have the ring current that's being induced by the pi system, by the double bond, 
and you also have the fact that the hydrogen is directly bonded to a carbon and that carbon is double bonded to an oxygen. Oxygen's electronegative, that makes a very strong dipole this way, which makes a relatively strong dipole this way. Those are <coughs> additive factors because they're both deshielding events. And so if we go to the aldehyde proton and see where it shows up, it's usually 9 to 10. And let's see if we have it on here. Aldehyde proton, it shows up in the 9 to 10 range. It's one of the only ways you can get that far downfield. The other way is to be on a carboxylic acid, which shows up at about 10 to 12, sometimes as easy as high as 14, depending upon what the identity of the R group is. Alrighty, so those are some of the details. Um, OH and NHs, uh, oxygen's electronegative, but this is a single bond. Nitrogen's electronegative, so a single bond. These can slide around a lot, so it has here 3.5 to 4.5, but I've seen them honestly anywhere from like 2, 2.5 two to like 5, 5.5. Five so it's a pretty big range, and they tend to actually broaden out a little bit. So just a, a quick little note about this. Uh, normally, a proton is nice and sharp if it's a singlet, which we haven't gotten to multiplicity yet, but we will. An OH tends to do that, and an NH tends to do that. It just They look like shorter, little fatter things, rather than nice, sharp, tall, skinny. So this would be like a CH3 group, for example, and that would be like an OH. You know, just We'll look at some real examples. Okay. Like I said a minute ago, the, the proton for carboxylic acid, offset 2.0, that means it's all the way out here at 12, and you can see it's also kind of broadened a little bit. If you look how sharp this peak is, and you compare what this peak looks like, it's definitely broadened. That's because it's an OH peak. So, all right. So we have four four key factors we need to pay attention to. It's the number of signals, the location of the signals, the integration of the signals, and the multiplicity of the signals. All right. So let's take a look at the number of signals. So in this molecule, we have methyl tert-butyl ether. There are two types of hydrogens in this molecule. There's the type of hydrogen that's part of a methyl group that's directly bonded to the oxygen. And there's the type of hydrogen that's part of a methyl group that's bonded to the carbon that's bonded to the oxygen. Since there are two types of hydrogen, there will be two signals in this molecule, and indeed there are. One of these signals will integrate for nine, because there are nine hydrogens that make up that signal. And the other signal will integrate for three, because there are three hydrogens that make up that signal. Now, depending upon what the, where the spectrum comes from and who made it, a lot of times these are reduced to the lowest whole number value. So instead of nine to three, it would just say one to three. Right? Uh, I tend to just give you the absolute numbers, so I will, I will usually express the integration as 3H. So you know explicitly there are three hydrogens that make up that molecule, and there are nine hydrogens that make up that molecule. All right. That's pretty simple. Okay. Um, if we look at a slightly more uh, complex molecule, we have three types of hydrogen in this molecule. We have the type of hydrogen that's on a methyl that's next to a ketone. We have the type of hydrogen that's part of a methylene, a CH2 is called a methylene, right? that exists between the two ketones. And we have all the methyls that are part of the T-butyl group. Right? All these are the same as each other. So we have A, B, and C. And if we compare deshieldedness and we look at the x-axis location, since these hydrogen C, let's put subscript C, right, hydrogen C is sandwiched between two carbonyls, it's much more deshielded downfield than hydrogen B, which is much more deshielded than hydrogen A. And again, the integrations, the size of the signals, would be 9H. 3H and 2H. And you can see it's about 2 to 3, 3 to um, three to 1 ratio here, 2 to 3 ratio here, things like that. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip over the solved problems. You guys feel free to look at it if you want. The integration is exactly what I just talked about. It's how many protons make up that signal. So I'm going to go through that. Spin, spin, splitting, also called AKA multiplicity. This is a very confusing but also very powerful and useful technique. Non-equivalent protons on adjacent carbons have magnetic fields that interfere with each other and this is something I have not brought up yet intentionally. So let's lo not look at words, let's look at its structures. Consider this molecule 1,1,2-tribromoethane. <clears throat> Normally, we would say we have two types of protons. We have the HA proton, the carbon 
<coughs> the hydrogen that's on the carbon that has two bromines, and we have the hydrogen that's on the carbon that has one bromine. Those are our two types. So we should see two signals, and indeed we do. We see a signal here and a signal there. <coughs> However, because HA, as labeled here, HA, <coughs> excuse me, because HA has a neighbor, i.e. HB, the magnetic field of B from the nucleus interferes with the magnetic field of A. So before we said HA has some value in the alpha state and HA has some value in the beta state and when we irradiate we turn all the alphas to betas then we wait around and let the betas decay back down into the alphas and we measure that using the detector and that's when the detector says I see something and draw a signal right that's normally what we've been doing but what we haven't been considering is the fact that because HA is very close in space ie three bonds away from HB HA kinda knows what HB is up to which means HB kind of knows what HA is up to in terms of which spin state does it exist within. Does it exist as an alpha or a beta? And what this does to the signal is it takes it from a single value signal where you just get one peak and it splits it, hence the name spin spin splitting, into multiple peaks. So each one of these things right here is a peak within the signal and that's why I'm very being very careful with my language right this whole thing is the signal but each one of these is a peak within that signal so what we say is that this signal is split into three peaks and we give that a special name we call it a triplet All right so if you're I'll do it over here if you're one peak it's called the singlet Oops, excuse me. Someone must be at the door. My guard dog is going off. Okay, back. Sorry about that. My uh, <laughs> my guard dog puppy doesn't like when people approach the house. It's got to keep me safe. So uh, one peak is called a singlet. If you have two peaks within your signal, we call that a doublet. If you have three peaks, we call that a triplet. If you have four peaks, we call that a quartet. If you have five peaks, we call that a quintet. Technically six peaks, sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't. It's called a sextet. And then seven or more peaks is called a complex multiplet just means there's a bunch of shit there you can't tell what it is right. okay so where does this spin spin splitting come from let's look at some examples if I'm talking about <coughs> um, HB for example right HB knows what HA is up to <coughs> <coughs> sorry um, so HB normally would have some signal and it would be uh, a singlet that integrates for two but because HB has this neighbor, HA, his signal is now split into two possibilities. Either HB can be reinforced by HA, meaning they match, <coughs> or HB can be opposed by what HA is doing, because HA has to be either in the alpha or the beta state. Those are the only options once the magnet is turned on. So once HA agrees, you get one peak, once HA disagrees, you get the other peak, and so HB, and now I'm saying HB, but you know technically there are two of them that I'm talking about. Collectively, HB has one neighbor, HA, which has two states, and so HB's signal gets split into two peaks, right, which we call a doublet. And specifically, in this case, it would be a doublet that integrates for two, which normally we write like this, 2H doublet. Now, HA has the same problem. However, HA has two neighbors to worry about. So HA has some particular spin value, and there are three permutations now that can exist. Either HB can both agree with HA, so you get this case, which reinforces the magnetic field, 
or HB can uniformly disagree with HA, right? So supposing HA was up, if HB uniformly disagrees, you get um, HB protons opposing the magnetic field. But now you also have the case where one of the HB agrees, but the other disagrees, or one of the HB disagrees, but the other agrees. Those are the same as each other. And so you get them essentially canceling each other out. Right? So the HA signal has been split into a triplet. So we say this is a 1H, because there's only one hydrogen that I'm talking about, HA. And it has two neighbors, so it becomes a triplet. Because of the different permutations that the spin states that HB can exist as. Hopefully that makes sense. In lab, this is the part that I skipped over. Um, so essentially the way this works then is that the number of peaks you observe, this is an important thing, make sure you write this down, the number of peaks that you observe on the spectrum itself is equal to the number of neighbors, in this case HA has two neighbors, plus one. So there's two neighbors, so the number of peaks observed for HA would be two neighbors plus one, which would be three, which we call triplet, and that's what we see. Right? This, while confusing, is very important to know, so please make sure you understand that. Right, the number of neighbors. So now your question is, what the hell is a neighbor? Simply put, mm, simply put, a neighbor, I'll write it here. Let's see if there's a better place to write it. A neighbor is three carbon hydrogen or carbon carbon bonds away. So if you go from, if you start at a hydrogen, let me clean this up, if you start at a hydrogen and you traverse three carbon carbon or three carbon hydrogen bonds and it takes you to another hydrogen nuclei, then that does indeed count as a neighbor. So if I go from HA to here, that's one, to here, that's two, to here, that's three, M, where I am, is it a hydrogen nucleus? Yes, therefore it counts as a neighbor. Do the same thing for the other one. One, two, three, is that a hydrogen nucleus? Yes, that counts as a neighbor. If I go one, two, three, is this a hydrogen nucleus? No, it's a bromine, so that does not count as a neighbor. We're doing proton NMR spectroscopy here, so we don't care about bromines and stuff like that, at least in so far as counting neighbors. Now if I'm talking about HB, I go three bonds away. If I'm talking about this guy, I go here, here, and here, one, two, three. Is that a hydrogen nucleus? Yes, so that counts as a neighbor. You might ask, how come you don't go, erase damn it, how come you don't go one, two, that counts as a neighbor. The reason that that is not a neighbor is because this HB and this HB are the exact same thing as each other. You can't be a neighbor if you are the same thing, right? I, my name is Jay. I live in a house. Jay is not a neighbor to Jay because I don't have a clone of myself living in the house next door to me. Right? That's what a neighbor is. You have to be um, next to. So these HBs are the same as each other, and we can use my Jay's silly talking uh, <laughs> example to try and figure out. I'm a hydrogen that's on a carbon that has one bromine. I'm a hydrogen that's on a carbon that has one bromine. I'm a hydrogen that's on a carbon that has two bromines. So this is distinct from that. It takes a little getting used to, but once you once you understand it, you'll be able to pick out what are exact or equivalent hydrogens, uh, easy peasy. All right, so it turns out because of this n plus 1 rule, that's what the neighborhood is. It's called the n plus 1 rule. That's what this is right here. It's the n plus 1 rule. Because of the n plus 1 rule, what we end up actually making is Pascal's triangle. So if you have, um, if you're a singlet, you could just have one peak. If you have two, um, if you have two neighbors, then you get one, two, one. If you have three neighbors, you get one, three, three, one. These are the relative peak heights. So that's one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And it gets all wonky, but I don't care about that. It doesn't really matter. Um, spin, spin, splitting distance. Okay, so in addition to, and I'm sure you, you're loving this already, in addition to the spin, spin, splitting occurring, there's also the spin-spin splitting distance. So um, we're going to ignore long-range long coupling for now. Um, and let's look at a good example. Mm, hopefully, yeah, let's look at this one. 
Uh, let me zoom in for a minute. How do I zoom in? I think I can press this button. Hey, all right. So, and this is one of the things that makes proton NMR spectroscopy so powerful, is that not only is there how many peaks the signal is split into, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which means it has six neighbors, specifically these guys. There's also the distance between each one of these peaks, right? So I can measure how far is it from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and from here to here, right? I can measure all those things. Each one of these is called a coupling constant. A coupling constant. And the coupling constant is actually referred to as the J value. So if I'm talking about um, the interaction of HC with HB, there will be some particular J value associated with that, meaning how strongly does C get to interact with B, so we would say that would be J subscript BC, the coupling constant J that is representative of the interaction between hydrogen B and hydrogen C. Okay, let's see, I can zoom out again. Right, so we can measure those coupling constants, and if you really want to get, you know, take you know, high-level spectroscopy classes, you'll use the coupling constants and their values to actually determine the structure of molecules. Right, we're not going to do that too much. Um, we're just going to do um, stuff like this. Right? We'll be giving a molecular formula. In lab, on your lab final, for example, you have to do this. In the ACS exam, you usually don't have to do this, but you do need to be able to interpret it a little bit, right? So given a molecular formula, C4H10O, here's the NMR spectrum, figure out the structure, right? Propose the structure. That's what you need to do. So the first thing we recognize is that we have one, two, three, four signals. So we have four types of hydrogen, right? If there are ten hydrogens total, but there's only four types, then obviously some of the hydrogens have to be the same as each other. If we look at where they're at on the x-axis, they're all down in the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 range. So for the most part, most of them are uh, relatively not terribly de-shielded. Okay? We could calculate degrees of unsaturation. I'm not going to bother to do that now. Um, I'm going to start and actually look at the splitting. So let me zoom in a little bit. Okay. If we look at the splitting, uh, I like to do the singlets first and the doublets and the triplets. We see a singlet at... Uh, uh, 2.4, 2.5, it looks like. And are the integrations not shown on here? Hmm. Doesn't look like the integrations are shown. In my examples, um, I will give integrations. So uh, I'm pretty sure this is an integration of 1. Let's see, it says the molecular formula, 4 types in the ratio 2 to 1 to 1 to 6. There we go. So 2H, 1H, 1H, and 6H. Right? They didn't give us to that problem. I'll give it to you in my class. Okay. So a 1H singlet means I have a hydrogen bonded to something that has no neighbors. So if it's a carbon or if it's an oxygen, then the next this atom cannot be hydrogens right there. This, um, if it was an oxygen, then I can't go over the oxygen for counting neighbors. Um, so that one's done. If I look at this doublet, a 2H doublet. Well, if it's two H's, I'm talking about two hydrogens that are same as each other. So essentially they're going to be on the same carbon. If it's a doublet, per the n plus 1 rule, I have to have exactly one neighbor. So that means whatever I have here, I can only one of them can have a hydrogen. Whatever's not there, or whatever is here, cannot have hydrogens on it. I can only have one. Otherwise, this would no longer be a doublet. Okay. Uh, I'll do the next doublet, a 6H doublet. 6H means you have to have six hydrogens that are the same as each other like that, so um, an isopropyl group. And if it's a doublet, it has these collectively, these guys collectively, have to have one neighbor, because 1 plus 1 equals 2. So it means I have to have an isopropyl group. Well, that makes sense, because I also then would have to have a 1H that has a bunch of peaks, specifically 7, um, 6 plus 1, Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We're going to ignore this for a minute and ignore that tiny little guy um, for reasons that are beyond the scope of this class. And so this guy then is the 1H. These guys go together and say, I have an isopropyl group. Then I have 
either an OH or a CH, and then I have a CH2. So if I draw all these pieces floating around in space, right, there's really only one way I could put it together, right, and go jump to the next one, there we go. We can only put it together this way. There's our isopropyl, there's our CH2 that has exactly one neighbor, and there's the OH, the 1H one, the one singlet, right. So that's what we've been doing in lab, that's what I'm going to ask you to do on the final. Uh, I will give you the integrations to make it a little bit easier, and I'll give you the molecular formulas as well. Okay, so let's talk about those coupling constants for a little bit. Now I'm not going to go into huge detail, and the ACS exam isn't going to go into huge detail about coupling constants either, but if we were just talking about the interaction between this hydrogen and that hydrogen, right, as we did in the example 1,1,2-tribromoethane, uh, right, that coupling constant, the distance between the peaks within the signal of a given hydrogen is about 7 hertz. If the hydrogens are cis to each other in a double bond, it's about 10 hertz, which in order to convert it to ppm, remember you have to divide by the spectrometer frequency. Uh, if it was trans, it's 15 hertz. If they're geminal, meaning on the same carbon, it's 2 hertz, right, things like that. Ortho, meta, para. Uh, para is missing, huh? Ortho and meta, you know, have different hertz. These are not things you would memorize. These are clearly values that you would... Um, refer to or look up in a table, but the point is that for every different permutation, and I think these are not, I think these are not, um, I don't think those couple, I think that's why it's missing, um, right, you can look up the value and say, what is the relationship between this one and that one? Oh, it's 6 hertz, so I divide that by my spectrometer frequency, and I can get the delta shift I expect to see, right, so uh, let's look at, uh, we can look at this one paranitrotoluene, right? So here's our example right here. How many signals should we expect to see? We have the type of hydrogen that's on the methyl. We have the type of hydrogen that's next to it. We have the type of hydrogen that's next in line, and then that doesn't have any hydrogens at all. So we have three types, so we should see three signals, and we do. So far, so good. Integrations. Let's look at the, the area under the curve of the heights. Since HC is composed of three protons, it should be um, a 3 to 2 to 2 ratio between the heights of the peaks or the area under the curves, and you can see how tall this one is. So it is indeed 3 to 2 to 2. In fact, they give it to you right there. How many neighbors does HC have? Well, let me draw HC this way to make it a little bit easier to count. So there's our three H's. So if I go 1 bond, 2 bond, 3 bonds, it takes me here. One bond, two bond, three bonds, it takes me here. Those are not hydrogens. They have hydrogens, but they're not hydrogens. And so HC, as drawn, has no neighbors. So 0 plus 1 means it shows up as uh, one peak, which we call a singlet. And it is. Notice it's a singlet not at the 0 0.5 to 1 to 1.5 range, but because it's on the benzene ring and you get that ring current, it's shifted downfield, deshielded a little bit. If we talk about the hydrogens that are on HA, um, HA, how many neighbors do they have? 1, 2, 3. HA has an HB. 1, 2, 3. HA has an HB. So collectively, um, HA, all right, collectively they have, they have one neighbor. And this, I understand why this is confusing. If you count them separate, right, if I say 1, 2, 3, that counts. 1, 2, 3, that counts. You would count two neighbors. But the neighbor that you're counting is exactly the same due to the symmetry in the molecule. Right? So you're really counting the same thing twice. And so that's why, even though it seems confusing, like HB, this HB, and this HB should be counted separately, it's the same neighbor getting counted because of molecular symmetry. And so HA collectively has one neighbor, and HB collectively has one neighbor. And so they both show up as doublets. And because there's two HAs, it's a 2H doublet. And because there's two HBs, it's a 2H doublet. All right, so the, the substituted benzenes can be a little tricky. Um, we can go ahead and do all these. I'm not going to bother. You can look at them if you want. But the rest is just following this protocol, right? So I have a hydrogen here, the hydrogen here. These guys are all the same as each other. This is different. This is different. These two are different. These two are different and hopefully you can figure that out, right? And if you use the J's talking method, right? I'm a hydrogen that's on a methyl that's on the uh, four position of the ring. I'm a hydrogen that's on a methyl that's on the four position of the ring. Those are the same. I'm a hydrogen that's on uh, 
uh, a double bond that's on the third position on the ring. I'm a hydrogen that's on a double bond that's on the second position of a ring. I'm a hydrogen that's part of a methylene that's on the second position. I'm a hydrogen that's on the methylene that's on the third position. You know, things like that. So you can figure out which ones are which, and you can, uh, it would be good practice to go and label, let me clean this up, it would be good practice to label this molecule and figure out which peak is this, which peak is this, or excuse me, which signal is this, which signal is this, which signal is that, right? Um, this one should be easy, right? It's the tallest, it's a singlet, and it's very shielded. It shows up at about 1.2. So right off the bat, you should know which one that is. All right. So we're not going to worry too much about complex splitting in here. Um, I'll just go over it really quick. This is an ugly structure, so let me just redraw it. All right, suppose I was talking about the, the monomer styrene. All right, now you have actually two things going on. You have this interaction, right, which is, this is A, this is B, and this is C. These are all unique from each other. Why? A is cis to the ring structure, B is trans to the ring structure, and C is gem, geminal, to the ring structure. So those are all unique from each other. So A interacts with B according to a geminal coupling constant, but A interacts with C according to a trans coupling constant. And that is indeed neighbors, HA and HC, because one, two, three bonds does indeed take me to a hydrogen nucleus. Uh, HB is geminal to A, so it counts as a neighbor because it is not unique, right? HB and HA are different from each other. But HB is cis to HC, so it splits HB signal gets split by A, and then it gets split by C. So you get splitting upon splitting, and that's what we call a complex splitting, and uh, that's about all I'm going to say about that, right? So for example, if we look at HA, just do a quick notice, and HA has two neighbors, so that means it, got, it has to get split twice, once by HC and once by HB. HB is the bigger coupling constant, so the coupling constant for A to B splitting, that's the trans splitting, is 17 hertz. So that takes our normal signal and splits it into two, i.e. a doublet. But because of this complex splitting now, A interacting with C has a smaller coupling constant, 11 hertz. Each one of these guys gets split now. So what you get is a doublet of doublets that is not symmetrically split. Right? You get, um, well I mean it's symmetrically split, but it's not... Um, it's not split the same amount. It's 17 first, followed by 11. Whereas if I talk about HB, first the relationship between AB is 17, just like before, so that gets split. But now the geminal splitting here, B to C, is only 1.4. So you get a different doublet of doublets. So HA, let me clean this up, HA and HB both have uh, two neighbors. A, a has B and C. B has A and C, but because of the different nature of the types of splitting, trans versus geminal versus cis, you get different patterns of doublets and doublets. So like I said, that's kind of just outside the scope of this course. I want to just introduce you to it, show it exists, um, but I really, we're not going to do much with it, and you're not going to see it. But there, it just goes to the power of proton and MR spectroscopy. Okay, so that's, um, that's for the most part our proton and MR and you can figure out the spectrum if you want. If you really wanted to look at in detail, look what the ring does, right, in the aromatic region. All kinds of crazy stuff goes on. So there's lots of lots of information to be gained there. Um, I'm going to also briefly go over this as well, although I'm not going to um, I'm not going to get into it too much. Um, when we talk about methanol, or in this case ethanol. Um, There's a thing called stereochemical non-equivalence. So essentially what we do is we say, what we've been doing is we're saying, well, this is an H that's on a, uh, a methyl that's part of methanol. This is an H that's on a methyl that's part of uh, ethanol. This is an H that's on a methyl that's part of ethanol, et cetera. So therefore, they're all the same as each other. And that's true. They are. But of course, this is chemistry. So we have to have those are the rules. So we have to have exceptions to the rules. Sometimes it doesn't actually work out that way, right? If I act, if I pretend to replace one of the atoms, and I generate stereochemistry upon doing it, now they no longer become equivalent. So before, I would say, I'm, an, I'm a hydrogen that's on a uh, part of a dull bond that's part of um, one bromo, pro, uh, 
three bromopropene, right? I say I'm a hydrogen that's part of a double bond that's on one three bromopropene, right? That's while that method works, this these diastereotopic protons will actually split each other. And this goes back to the styrene example that we just looked at. Because A is cis to the bromine and B is trans to the bromine, their interactions, their coupling constants will be different. And so A, if I imaginarily replace A with some fake element Z, that would be a different molecule than if I were to imaginarily replace B with some fake atom Z. And so what I'm generating when I do this fake replacement is I generate diastereomers, and therefore we say that these are diastereotopic protons, and therefore they do indeed split each other. So A and B would now become neighbors, even though, per my shortcut that I've been using throughout this whole presentation, uh, they otherwise wouldn't be. Okay. Um, you can do it with all different types of molecules. Now here's a good example. Um, before, when we had methanol, or excuse me, we had ethanol a couple slides back, they were not diastereotopic, right? But this hydrogen, if I replace it with something like Z, right, would give a diastereomer as as compared to if I replace the other one with some fake atom Z, right? So what is the relationship between this and this? They're diastereomers, right? The bottom one is the exact same, but one of the stereocenters has been flipped, and so when you flip one of the stereocenters, but not all of them, you get diastereomers. So these are di these two are indeed diastereotopic protons and so they actually will split each other right so it's kind of a it's kind of a fringe case in my in my example or my point of view but whatever it is what it is right so um, if we want to look at an actual example of the splitting the methyl group has exactly one neighbor so it shows up as a doublet and it does but these two hydrogens do indeed split each other so not only you get this interaction one, two, three, you get these two guys, you also get this interaction, right? And so you get splitting upon splitting. So for, clean this up, yeah, let me zoom in too. Okay, so for this hydrogen, he has one neighbor, one, two, three, two neighbors. So he's actually going to be split twice. And if you look very closely at this signal, one, two, three, four peaks. Do the same thing for this middle one, he has one neighbor, he has another neighbor, so he'll be split twice as well. And if we look very closely, one, two, three, four. And then last but not least, same argument. This guy is split by this one, this one is split by that one. And so he has um, he has one, two, three, four, five, six peaks. Is that right? Why, oh, am I missing something? Oh, and uh, these guys. So he has one, two, three, four, five, five neighbors total. And so he should be 5 plus 1, 6 peaks, and that's why he's a sextet. Okay, so um, I'm not going to worry so much about time dependence uh, for proton and MR. Uh, if we're talking about cyclohexanes, right, we know that cyclohexane, we can have a proton in the axial, or it can do a chair flip and put it in the equatorial. Um, they interconvert back and forth, so basically what we see is the average. Uh, same thing for OH and NHs. Um, if we take a sample of, uh, zoom in a little bit, of pure ethanol, ultra pure ethanol, then we should see one signal for the OH peak. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into why it does or does not show splitting. But if the ethanol is even remotely impure for whatever reason then you see your no splitting and it shows up. So let's, I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't want to go too far into that. Okay, uh, the NH proton, remember I said it tends to broaden out. There it is, for example, integrates for two because there are two hydrogens that we're talking about. Um, one of the ways you could figure out what the OH or the NH peak is is by just adding <laughs> uh, DOD, which is deuteriated water. So instead of adding H2O, you use the heavy element of, hyd of hydrogen, deuterium, and so if the deuterium swaps with the hydrogen just through normal acid-base chemistry with itself, then you get the signal disappearing, right? The OH that you had will go away, and so let's see if we can show an example of that. We don't have an example of that, right? So in the top case, you had an alcohol, which was kind of a broad peak. After you add deuterium to your sample, that peak will disappear, 
if it does disappear, you know that was the one that corresponded to this hydrogen. Okay, so that's it for proton and MR. Um, next up is carbon-13 and MR. I'm going to put that in a separate video so I can just break it up, and so you guys can take a little break, and I need a little break as well. Uh, carbon-13 is much simpler, though. So whereas hydrogen had a lot of things we had to pay attention to, pay attention to, look for, or extract, carbon-13 is much, much more simple. So it'll be a shorter video and much more easy to comprehend. Um, so make sure you um, have watched this video for class on Monday because we're just going to do some examples of solving the structure and look more closely at the peaks and the splitting and things like that uh, in class. And then, of course, if you're in lab, that will be about 80% of what your lab final will be. So hopefully this was helpful. Uh, good luck, guys, and I'll see you soon.